Okay, uh, shall we start the uh, evening session? Uh, this is the last session of this conference. Uh, we have four speakers and uh, uh, 30 minutes for each speaker. And after the session, Professor uh, Xiaohua Zhou will give you a closed remark. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Professor Steen Westliland. Uh, let me give a brief uh, introduction to uh, Professor Steen Westliland. Uh, Steen is a worldwide well-known uh, expert in color inference, uh, missing data analysis, and uh, uh, semi-parametrics. Uh, he is currently a full professor and uh, in Ghent University uh, at the Department of uh, uh, Applied uh, Mathematics and uh, Computer Science and Statistics. Uh, he is also jointly affiliated with the uh, Department of Medical Statistics at the London School of Hygiene and uh, uh, Tropical Medicine. Uh, Steen graduated as a master in mathematics at Ghent University in 1998 and obtained PhD uh, in mathematics in 2002. And he uh, used to uh, do uh, postdoc research at the Harvard, you know, uh, Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Steen uh, uh, has, uh, has served as co-editor of uh, Biometrics, right? And uh, also associate editor for several uh, famous uh, statistical journals. Uh, okay, uh, lo now let's welcome Professor Steen Westerlin to give the talk. Uh, today he will talk about assumption and inference for uh, Cox regression parameters. Let's welcome Professor uh, Steen Westerlin to give the talk. Thank you very much uh, for the for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me just get the slides there. Okay. Is this, uh, looking okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's uh, it's really a, a pleasure to speak at this meeting. Uh, too bad uh, I cannot be here in person because I, I really enjoyed the uh, the the first meeting uh, that I attended um, a few years ago. Um, I'm going to present today joint work with um, two postdocs, Oliver Dukes and Kelly Van Lanker, both at Ghent University, but now spending a year in the United States. No need to say, no need to say that the hazard ratio is, is one of the most reported measures of, of association in EPI and medicine for, for various reasons. Um, as you know, it's the canonical parameter in, in a Cox model, but also it gives us a way of capturing the degree of association between an exposure and a time to event endpoint in a way that is not depending on time. So that with a single uh, scalar parameter, we can, uh, we can basically express how strong the association is. Hazard ratios have also been uh, criticized over recent years, especially in the causal inference literature. And even though I have contributed to some of, of the critique, I do think that hazard ratios uh, remain quite useful um, because I think in, in many cases proportionality of hazards is going to be roughly uh, a not too unreasonable approximation and that, in that sense if you give me a hazard ratio then uh, there's a lot I can learn in terms of causal effects because the hazard ratio basically allows me to translate any survival risk um, in the absence of treatment to what the corresponding survival risk would be for that group with treatment. So of course, there's lots of deficiencies, but I, I do think um, if we have to work with a single number, um, then the hazard ratio has a lot of strength. Um, the common way of estimating hazard ratios is, is using Cox regression, and, and that obviously has great appeal, but also its own deficiencies. It's unlikely that we will have perfect proportionality in terms of hazards, and it's perhaps even more unlikely that we'll be able to model all covariate effects successfully. And that is a major concern because we don't usually understand very well where the hazard ratio estimator is converging to when the model is misspecified. It, for instance, if proportionality of hazards is not really quite true, then um, the partial likelihood estimator is not simply converging to a weighted average of time varying hazard ratios. And if we misspecify covariate effects, then even when exposure and time to event endpoint are independent given covariates, then um, the partial likelihood estimator may still uh, not converge to one. 
um, which is not really what we would like to see. The usual way of dealing with this is to make the Cox model sufficiently complex. And in practice, we would make use of data adaptive procedures like variable selection algorithms or model building strategies that use the data to learn how the model should be looking like. And that can make things better, but there's also a number of concerns related to this that have received quite a bit of, of attention recently in causal inference. One concern is that in practice, if you build Cox models, we, we tend to make compromises between simplicity on the one hand, we'd like to keep the model simple so that we can communicate the results in, a, in an easy way. But on the other hand, we wanna bring in sufficient complexity to, so that hopefully the model is correct. And those compromises inevitably be, lead to model misspecification and, and bias as a result. And the standard inference that we provide ignores this. And it also ignores that the, the model came about through some data adaptive process. Uh, what we usually pretend is that the, uh, at least in terms of how we do inference, is, is that the final selected model was as, as pre-specified. So all of these concerns um, mean that standard inferences that we provide under Cox models are very likely biased and, and overly optimistic. Can we do better? Well, um, we could sidestep these problems by, by starting with um, a non-parametric S demand or effect measure to begin with. And then um, we could develop non-parametric inference uh, for that S demand based on the efficient influence function. And, and that's very typical of, of recent progress in causal inference. Um, the developments on targeted and de-biased machine learning are, are very much in that spirit. Now, most of that literature on, on targeted learning or de-biased uh, learning basically avoids statistical modeling with the aim to summarize. There's a lot of modeling happening in the background um, to deal with the course of dimensionality, to make sure we model confounders well, but there's not much modeling going on in terms of um, defining the effect measure. In particular, there's a lot of focus on uh, dichotomous exposures and, and fairly simple questions like, how would the survival curve look like if everyone were treated or if no one were treated? And that brings a lot of appeal and uh, because of the simplicity, but it also makes these um, estimates and, and developments uh, somewhat limiting. As soon as we go to more complex settings that maybe involve repeated measures, exposures, or, uh, or involved continuous exposures. In particular, what I often get to see is that um, continuous exposures are being dichotomized um, in order to answer questions like, what if everyone were obese? Um, and of course, there's developments in causal inference specifically for continuous exposures, but even those um, may have their limitations. Um, like some papers focus on questions such as what if everyone had a BMI of 25, which is maybe not the most scientifically interesting question. And because of the complexity, um, it, 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 it's very common that even uh, people who adhere very much to these principles eventually fall back into standard statistical modeling. Uh, for instance, uh, Cox um, marginal structure models are very common for dealing with uh, time varying exposures in survival analysis. And of course, once we go back to, to standard modeling, we, we're also back with, with the problems I was discussing before. In a forthcoming GRSSB discussion paper uh, on uh, generalized linear models, we, we therefore advocate a parallel development, not, not aiming to be a substitute for, uh, for the approach I, I just discussed, but uh, we basically aim for a more generic development um, that can easily handle continuous exposures um, um, and, and can easily bring in complexities basically by being centered around standard statistical models. And so today I'm going to um, basically extend this approach to Cox regression. In particular, I'm going to use a Cox model basically to give us a summary for the association of interest, just like we would normally use Cox models precisely uh, to describe and, and, and summarize associations between an exposure and time to event endpoint. But in how I'm going to do inference, I'm, I'm not going to assume the Cox model to be correct. In fact, I'll invoke machine learning methods, as you'll see, just like in the target learning literature. And, and that will allow me to acknowledge all the uncertainty from data adaptive modeling. Mm -hmm. 
How can we achieve this? Well, um, suppose I, I would want to use a model of the following form. So the hazard uh, of the event of interest at time t, uh, given an exposure A, which could be binary or continuous, and given a high dimensional um, set of covariates, which I'm going to assume is sufficient to adjust for confounding. I'm only interested here in the exposure effect. So this part of the model I'll, I'll make explicit. And in particular, I'm, I'm assuming explicitly at, at the moment that the exposure effect is constant in time and covariates, but I'm not going to say anything about how the time and covariate effects look like. So it's a, you could say a relaxation of the Cox model because I'm not specifying anything about how L relates to the hazard. My aim with this model is only to summarize the exposure effect. This gives me a particular way of, of summarizing the association between A and the time to event endpoints. I'm not going to assume that the model uh, effectively holds. Now to separate this modeling with the aim to summarize the patterns in the data from modeling uh, that aims to, to handle the curse of dimensionality, um, in, in the reasoning I'll make, I'll, I'll start assuming that we knew the hazard. So someone told me what the hazard was at each time t, at each feasible exposure level, and each feasible covariate level. Suppose this information we have, then the question is how can we now summarize the dependence on A? Because after all, the job of a statistician is to make certain approximations and, and, and summarize uh, the dependence, for instance, of this hazard on A. All right, well, let me start with a binary exposure. Well, then um, the answer is, is fairly simple. At each time T and each covariate stratum L, uh, we could look at a log hazard ratio, which basically is one, one way of expressing a causal effect, uh, if we have it at each time T at least. Um, if we do that, well, then for each time T, we would get, we would get a distribution of estimate beta of T and L. Um, sorry, is that a question? No. Um, we obtain a distribution of estimates that is governed by the distribution of L. And so my aim here will be to basically summarize that distribution, um, which is also uh, not, an, not atypical, I would say, for, for a statistician shock. So we've chosen to summarize the distribution in terms of a central location. I'll, I'll, I'll take some kind of average, if you like, of these log hazard ratios as they vary between strata. Um, and I'll, one reason for looking at central location is basically to make sure that the estimate I'll focus on will agree with the parameter beta if this model holds. Uh, but hopefully, by just being uh, an average in, in some sense, uh, as I'll make specific later, of, of these log hazard ratios, the usual log hazard ratio interpretation remains safe even if that model is not correctly specified. We've chosen to work with a weighted average because that aligns very well, well with, I think, what we would intuitively hope to get when, when the model is misspecified. Um, and so I'm going to introduce what kind of weighted average we focus on uh, by first assuming that this log hazard ratio is constant in time, and then I'll relax it. So suppose that the log hazard ratio varies between covariate strata. Well, then what I'm going to report as a summary is basically an average of these log hazard ratios, um, but I'll focus on the average in a somewhat retargeted population. In particular, I'm going to take an average with respect to this, this distribution of L star, which is basically a tilted version of the observed uh, covariate distribution. Um, and you can see that I'm basically going to give higher weight to this covariate strata where the exposure varies a lot um, in an accumulated, accumulated sense. So over time, over the different time points, we see a lot of variability in the exposure because those are the strata where we can learn a lot about the exposure effects. And also the strata where uh, people will stay for a long time in the risk sets um, are more likely sampled um, in, um, you know, un under the distribution of L-star. Suppose next that the hazard or the log hazard ratio also varies in time, then I'll basically, for each person uh, selected in this retargeted population, I'm basically going to evaluate the log hazard ratio at a specifically selected time point, T star. 
which are basically draw from this distribution. And again, you can basically see that I'm going to um, make it more likely to sample time points where we see a lot of variability in the exposure or where the people are more, more likely in the risk set. Why these weights? Well, uh, obviously the chosen weights have a somewhat mathematical motivation. Um, one motivation for this is that if we deal with a continuous exposure, then the choice of weight basically means that we can prevent the need for inverse weighting by the exposure density, which I think uh, often makes the analysis rather tricky. Um, at a more um, substantive level, you could say that um, if I pick out people where we see uh, like a lot of variability in the exposure, uh, it basically means for a binary exposure, for instance, that uh, we make it more likely to sample people who uh, for whom both treatment options are, are, are reasonably likely. Um, and in that sense, I, I think there may be some connection potentially, at least in the rough sense, with how people would be selected for inclusion in a clinical trial, where we would, where we would also tend to sample people for whom both treatment options are, are sufficiently plausible. Is a weighted average a good summary? Well, um, of course, the more beta of TNL varies between straight or time points, the less appealing a summary becomes. And this is why we are currently looking also into the variability uh, over time points or covariate strata. If we learn that this variability is, is pretty small, then, uh, then we can uh, um, be pretty happy, I would say, by taking a, a summary. What if the exposure is continuous? Well, then obviously um, we will not just summarize like a log hazard ratio comparing treated and untreated. But in that case, we basically redefine this beta of TNL as like a least squares projection of the log hazard at a given time t on the exposure. And we do that basically in each covariate stratum and, and uh, risk set separately. Um, and so in that sense, you could say, uh, beta of TNL gives like a, a linear approximation of the dependence between the log hazard and the exposure. Let me tell you a bit, a bit about how we do the inference and then I'll give you a, an impression from simulation studies. I'm going to ignore censoring in the interest of time, but the, the developments we made uh, account for censoring. And in fact, the simulation studies all report uh, account for it as well. So the, the S demand, if we put everything together with the, uh, remember we're working with like a weighted average of, of log hazard ratios. And if we work out how the, the weighting uh, looks like, it basically leads to the following expression. Um, I basically have in, in that sense, you could say a model free S demand. Um, I have a, a definition for beta that is not connected to this Cox model that, that has a meaning even if the Cox model is wrong. Uh, but it happens to reduce to that same parameter in the Cox model if the model holds. Because we have a non-parametric way of expressing this, we can also estimate it in a non-parametric way without having to worry about model complexity. So a naive way of doing this could be to, um, to basically estimate the expected exposure in each risk set uh, using maybe some machine learning methods. And I'll, I'll call the prediction P hat. And likewise, we could obtain estimates of the hazards in an arbitrary way, potentially through machine learning. I'll call the estimates lambda hat. And then if we have those estimates, um, a naive estimator would, would basically be uh, replacing the population expectations by sample analogs, and that would lead to the following expression. Unfortunately, that estimator, which we call a plug-in estimator, is generally not doing a great job for, for multiple reasons. One is that um, even though uh, we, we could come up with estimators p hat and lambda hat, um, if those are obtained with very flexible data adaptive methods, then it's not so clear how the uncertainty in those estimators basically translates and propagates into the uncertainty of the entire estimator for beta. And so in that sense, we have no good clue how precise the estimator of beta hat, whether it has the normal distribution that we would like to see. Uh, that's very unlikely to be true. It's tempting to consider the bootstrap as a way out, but the bootstrap has no justification in these data adaptive settings. 
Um, the other concern is um, a related concern, but is more to do with bias. Uh, machine learning methods uh, are basically designed to minimize prediction error. Prediction is not my aim here. We rather want to have a good estimator, an efficient estimator for beta with low bias. And we have no guarantee that the, um, the bias variance trade-off that's being made for the machine learning um, also leads to an optimal bias variance trade-off in terms of the estimator for beta. Um, and so often we will tend to see quite a bit of bias um, in, in the resulting estimator, a bias that may not be shrinking uh, faster than one over root n and, and then becomes problematic asymptotically. We can learn a lot from uh, the asymptotic theory on, uh, from mathematical statistics to, to see how we can remove that plug-in bias. Um, and that's basically by uh, working with the efficient influence function of the estimand. The, the plug-in bias is uh, roughly approximated by minus the sample average of the efficient influence function. So if we can make that sample average equal to zero, then we basically get rid of, of the key component of bias. And that's basically how the estimation strategy work, works. We're going to calculate the efficient influence function and define the estimator for beta as the value that sets the sample average of those efficient influence functions to zero. That's also the principle behind debiased learning or targeted learning. This is for uh, the estimate that we consider how the efficient influence function looks like. Um, and so in practice, we, we take the sample average of these contributions across all people in the study and then solve it for beta, the beta that appears here. So it's a, a linear equation, very easy to solve. Uh, it, it leads to a closed form estimator. Once we can uh, substitute all of the unknowns by estimators. And so one unknown is P here. It's like a, a weighted average of the exposure in covariate strata weighted by the survivor function. Uh, the Q, similar, it's a, a weighted average of log hazards. Um, and, uh, and finally, there is the hazard uh, itself appears over here. So all of these will need to be substituted by estimates that uh, potentially we will obtain through machine learning. So setting the sample average to zero gives us a closed form estimator. Um, and when those estimates um, that we obtain through machine learning converge sufficiently quickly to the truth, then, uh, then it can be shown that the resulting estimator behaves asymptotically as if someone told us all the unknowns from the start, as someone gave us the true lambda, P and Q. And that's why in doing inference, we can basically pretend as if all of these nuisance functions were known, and that makes the variance of the estimator very easy to, to obtain. We can estimate it as one over n times the sample variance of these uh, efficient influence functions. That's quite a, a step forward, not our contribution, but, uh, um, but a key contribution of the targeted learning literature that even though we don't quite un understand very well how good the machine learning predictions are in, in terms of their uncertainty, we can still calculate the variance of that estimator. I'm going to skip over this and, and show you some results from simulations. Um, I'll look at two settings. The first one uh, considers variable selection. Uh, so I'm going to assume the Cox model holds here, but the focus is going to be on uh, how can we accommodate the uncertainty coming from variable selection. I'll work with a 10-dimensional covariate. We have a, a continuous exposure and then exponentially distributed event times and, and centering times. I'll look at a few strategies. So um, a naive strategy would be post lasso in the Cox model. So we use lasso only as a variable selection procedure and then we refit the model um, uh, with partial likelihood. Um, for the proposed approach, uh, we also work under the Cox model. Um, and to estimate the baseline hazard, we basically took numerical non-parametric derivatives of the survival function. And then uh, we used smoothing splines to, to smooth the, the obtained baseline hazard. For the exposure um, models, we use SuperLearner with a stepwise uh, selection strategies, linear additive models, and random forest regression. 
So here is a few results at sample size 200 and 400. Plugin one is the plugin estimator. I started with plugin two is the post lasso estimator. And you can see that they have a bias um, and that um, we, we, we have a poor job basically at getting the standard errors right, precisely because the uncertainty coming from the lasso regression is, is difficult to accommodate. This, the high coverage here is a bit deceptive because we have bias and, and overestimated standard errors. Um, but for the proposal, which is here with CML, we see much smaller bias. Um, standard errors that agree well with the empirical standard deviation and not perfect, but, but reasonably good coverage. Um, we also looked at a TMLE variant of the proposal that was usually doing slightly worse, but, but still uh, quite good. In a second simulation study, we looked at a, a much more challenging setting. Um, this time we have a binary exposure, but as you can see, very complex models uh, with a lot of linearities uh, motivated by a data generating mechanism that Ivan Diaz was using. Um, here we use survival random forest to estimate the survivor function. And then based on it, we obtain hazard estimates by taking numerical non-parametric derivatives uh, of a smooth survival function. And then to make those hazards smooth, we, we use smoothing splines and apply those to the obtained uh, non-parametric derivatives. Again, super learner was used for um, the exposure models. Um, and here is uh, some results at so sample size 500 and 1,000. Um, here I look at partial likelihood estimators from a, a Cox model we, uh, that has like main effects of the covariates, but is misspecified. And so you can see that we get poor coverage as a result that, that basically goes to zero. The plugin estimators, again, uh, we, we get a, a a difficult time at accommodating the uncertainty in the machine learning predictions. Um, and for the proposal, we again see smaller bias um, and, and reasonably good approximations of the standard error. Uh, so we were generally quite happy uh, because this is a setting where we are not using sample splitting, which ideally is needed um, in these machine learning approaches. Given the time, I'll maybe be quick and, and move to the uh, discussion. So um, the general principle that we try to accommodate in, in, in estimating or fitting a Cox model is to, to build the analysis around a model-free estimate. And that's very much the focus of the target learning theory. We've basically tried to, to relate this to, to statistical models. For the most part, the um, estimates that people focus on in causal inference are linked to a very specific causal question or, or sometimes chosen for mathematical convenience. There's some literature on projection estimates where um, uh, the estimate doesn't really have a lot of uh, um, uh, a good interpretation, I would say. So in our work, we've basically attempted to, to bridge the causal um, uh, inference literature to these developments on projection estimates by working with estimates that are fairly generic but still linked to, to models interpretable when the model is wrong and guaranteed to summarize the association of interest. Uh, I'll just move to the references and, uh, and leave some time for questions. So the, the focus of the talk was basically uh, in the last paper over here, and it's basically extending this uh, forthcoming GRSSB paper in the middle. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, so we still have uh, three minutes for questions. So any questions from the audience? Can I ask one? Do you hear me? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Shin. Um, I I was I know you didn't consider censoring because of I mean that would add a lot of extra notation and time. Uh, I was just yeah. curious. Um, will the estimate depend on the centering distribution then? Yeah, we, we initially, uh, yeah, that's a good question. We initially started working with um, an estimant that uh, indeed depends on the centering distribution, uh, but we were not quite happy with that. So um, uh, the, the estimant we're working with now is, is basically like reasoning counterfactually um, 
it, it's it's basically focused on the estimate and on the estimate you could say that that i have here so it's so like, what would happen if there was no censoring and then you no use your product exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool uh, that sounds sensible yes. <laughs> okay any more questions yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I have a question. Uh, um, yeah, yeah I, I like this idea very much uh, that you define a new estimate uh, that, that is free of model. Uh, but to me, it's uh, not so intuitive why uh, this is a, a causal estimate, why it is a, a causal effect, and how, yeah, yeah. how does this relate to the uh, yeah. uh, proportional hazard model yeah. uh, regression well, coefficient. Say, yeah. yeah. Well, the um, so um, so there's two things. First of all, the the estimate I'm working with, if if this partially linear Cox model holds that I was uh, defining, then um, then the estimate just reduces to like the uh, the log hazard ratio that you would see in that model. Of course, we know that uh, the causal interpretation of, of that hazard ratio is very subtle. And I would say um, only if we really have proportional hazards, then, uh, then a causal interpretation can be assigned in the, in the sense that you could, um, you could express how the survival curves uh, differ. The, you know, the, the hazard ratio in itself um, is not directly causally interpretable, but it allows you to uh, transport or translate like the counterfactual survival curve um, without treatment to how it would be with treatment. Um, and I agree that would only be the case if there is proportional hazards, which is probably not going to be uh, exactly met. But, but I think in many cases, especially because uh, in, in many cases, exposure effects are not too large, then, then I think it may be like a rough approximation. There's certainly deficiencies, but uh, I, I guess I'm not convinced that we have very good effect measures at the moment that uh, with, a, with a single number allow you to, to say a lot about uh, uh, causal effects on a, on a time to event endpoint. You could look at the uh, survival risk at a given time, but then you're still looking at this one time point, uh, which is also not great, I would say. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah.